I want to be careful in explaining the reason for this episode at this time. The subject of this episode is the master storyteller Orson Welles. But more specifically, it's about something he did to make him both famous and infamous. He convinced a fair number of people that the world was ending. And he did it with a fake news broadcast. In our present situation with the COVID-19 virus bringing earthly activity to a halt, and almost everyone glued to social media and cable news for the latest scraps of information, I thought it might be a good time to start taking stock about what we put in our heads. There are so many information competitions right now, and our environment being as tense as it is, it's easy to get frothed up in things that may or may not be true. To be clear, as of the recording of this episode, I do not believe that the coronavirus is fake news or overblown or some sort of conspiracy. I believe self-quarantining is an acceptable method, albeit eerie existence, of slowing down infection rates. Nonetheless, it's not hard to find hysterical theories or predictions or blatant and extreme political bias We're living through a moment in history where keeping one's cool is of paramount importance. And so, we need to take care of keeping those things from entering our psyche. So, in the spirit of learning from the past to inform the future, and keeping calm in the face of terrifying news, I present to you the live stream that ended the world. The quote-unquote media today is many things to many people. Updates that appear to push a narrative that some people don't like are often discarded as shoddy journalism, partisan, conspiracy, fake news. When in support of one's own worldview, however, their sources see the link. Did you even read the article? For those among us who hold in living memory the likes of Walter Cronkite or Edward Murrow, the evening news may still be a trusted source of information of the happenings of the world and the events outside their ticky-tacky little boxes. For those of us who have no idea who Edward Murrow is, our trusted sources are Facebook, Twitter, and Snopes. However you or I consume our news, whatever reliable medium, whatever trusted source, imagine for a moment your source was wrong, or worse, it was intentionally lying to you and to millions of people. And what if you had no idea? You would be living in their world, not yours, and you wouldn't even know it. It doesn't take a vivid imagination to see how this situation could get very ugly very quickly. In the 1930s, radio was overtaking newspapers as America's go-to source for information, much like the dynamic between cable TV and social media today. In this desperate war for survival, the battlefield was a competition of who is the most reliable, who is the fastest, and who is the most entertaining. And to the victor went the spoils of advertising dollars. And like the difference between journalism and partisan commentary today, sometimes the lines of news and entertainment were blurred. In late 1938, as the world was gripped with a tension that would be released as the worst war in human history, a relatively unknown 23-year-old theater actor and radio producer named Orson Welles had an idea for a new episode in his even more unknown radio anthology series, The Mercury Theater on the Air. He had decided that he would adapt H.G. Wells' book, War of the Worlds, into a live radio broadcast of the cataclysmic events that unfolded within its pages. His show, after all, did radio adaptations of classic works all the time, but this one was the first that would be intended to sound like a newscast. It began with the usual CBS intro, announcing to the very small but dedicated audience that the following was an adaptation of War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells. Orson Welles then opened up with a short monologue about 
how Earth was humming along towards the late 1930s. The economy was good. Men were working. The war scare was over. And he noted that 32 million people were listening to the radios. Ladies and gentlemen, here is the latest bulletin from the Intercontinental Radio News. Toronto, Canada. Professor Morris of Macmillan University reports observing a total of three explosions on the planet Mars between the hours of 7.45 p.m. and 9.20 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This confirms earlier reports received from American observatories. Now nearer home comes a special bulletin from Trenton, New Jersey. It is reported that at 8.50 p.m. a huge flaming object, believed to be a meteorite, fell on a farm in the neighborhood of Grover's Mill, New Jersey, 22 miles from Trenton. The flash in the sky was visible within a radius of several hundred miles, and the noise of the impact was heard as far north as Elizabeth. We have dispatched a special mobile unit to the scene, and we'll have our commentator, Carl Phillips, give you a word picture of the scene as soon as he can reach there from Princeton. In the meantime, we take you to the Hotel Martinet in Brooklyn, where Bobby Millett and his orchestra are offering a program of dance music. Imagine yourself in one moment listening to your favorite radio show to wind down a Sunday evening. And as usual at your show's first commercial break, you start flipping the dial looking for something interesting to fill the gap and you stumble upon that last piece of audio. You, like so many other of the 32 million people listening to their radios, never heard the intro about a radio dramatization. Your first thought, perhaps, is that a meteor had smashed into Earth. Your second thought might be that the Germans have launched a preemptive strike. What you're not thinking is that this is some 23-year-old's idea of good radio. Orson Welles' radio show was so low budget, it didn't even have a sponsor. Most people just simply wouldn't have recognized his voice on the radio. If the rest of your family wasn't already crowded around the radio, they are now, desperately waiting for the horrendous interlude music to give way to another live update. And of the brilliant musical interludes that amped up this tension, one of the show's producers said, quote, As it played on and on, its effects became increasingly sinister. A thin band of suspense stretched almost beyond endurance. The piano was the neatest trick of the show. End quote. Finally, a voice cuts off the music and announces that they're going to go live to their man on the ground near the crashed object in New Jersey. To the fictional Carl Phillips and the equally fictional astronomer and Princeton professor Richard Pearson, who is expertly voiced by none other than Orson Welles himself. What I can see of the object itself doesn't look very much like a meteor, at least not the meteors I've seen. It looks more like a huge cylinder, has a diameter of, um, um, what would you say, Professor Pearson? What's that? Uh, What would you say, uh, what's the diameter of this? About 30 yards. About 30 yards. The metal on the sheath is, well, I've never seen anything like it. The color is sort of... Yellowish white. It's curious. Spectators now are pressing close to the object in spite of the efforts of the police to keep them back. When Orson Welles was later asked what motivated him to adapt the War of the Worlds into the format you now hear it in, he replied, quote, I had conceived the idea of doing a radio broadcast in such a manner that a crisis would actually seem to be happening and would be broadcast in such a dramatized form as to appear to be a real event taking place at that time rather than merely a radio play. Now, we're not more than 25 feet away. Uh, can you hear it now? Uh, Professor Pearson? Yes, Mr. Uh, can you tell us the meaning of that scraping noise inside the thing? Possibly the unequal cooling of its surface. I see. Do you still think it's a meteor, Professor? I don't know what to think. You can see it's cylindrical uh, just a shape. Minute. Something's happening. Ladies and gentlemen, this is terrific. This end of the thing is beginning to flake off the... The top is beginning to rotate like a screw, and the thing must be hollow. He's moving! Look at that! Keep those turned back! Keep those idiots back! Our loyal reporter on the scene, Mr. Phillips, describes the moment when the Martian capsule opens up and begins to emerge from within. And Orson Welles deviantly amps up the tension and realism again. Ladies and gentlemen, it's indescribable, but I can hardly force myself to keep looking at it. It's so awful. The eyes are black and they gleam like a serpent. The mouth is that kind of V-shaped with saliva dripping from its rimless lips. It seems to oh, those quiver and pulsate and the monster or whatever it is can hardly move. It seems weighed down by uh, possibly gravity or something. The thing's rising up now and the crowd falls back. They've seen plenty. The most extraordinary experience, ladies and gentlemen, I can't find words. And 
Well, uh, pull this microphone with me as I talk. I'll have to stop the description so I can take a new position. Hold on, will you please? I'll be right back in a minute. Ladies and gentlemen, am I on? Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, here I am, back of a stone wall that adjoins Mr. Wilmer's garden. Please. Wait a minute, something's happening. A shape is rising out of the pit. I can make out a small beam of light against a mirror. What's that? There's a jet of flame springing from that mirror and it leaps right at the advancing men. It strikes them head on. Lord, they're turning into flames. Now the whole field's caught up by the woods. The bars, the, the gas tank, tanks of the automobiles are spreading everywhere. It's coming this way now, it's about 20 yards to my right. Ladies and gentlemen, due to circumstances beyond our control, we are unable to continue the broadcast from Grover's Mill. Evidently, there's some difficulty with our field transmission. However, we will return to that point at the earliest opportunity. In the meantime, we have a late bulletin from San Diego, California. Professor Indelkoffer, speaking at a dinner of the California Astronomical Society, expressed the opinion that the explosions on Mars are undoubtedly nothing more than severe volcanic disturbances on the surface of the planet. We continue now with our piano interlude. If you were nervous at the start of this broadcast, you're probably in either one of two states of mind right now. That this is pure rubbish and you're continuing down the dial for some real news. Or you're in a frozen panic trying to process the fact that the Earth is actually under attack by aliens. Police stations begin receiving hysterical phone calls, and radio station affiliates that are carrying this broadcast across the country are inundated with terrified listeners asking them if this whole thing is really happening. And when they're reassured by the local DJs that it's simply a radio drama, most people went back to their lives with a sense of relief, but some persisted in their panic. When the station comes back on the air in Orson Welles' world... The military has been mustered, martial law has been declared, and Earth's counterattack has begun. But there's also a new deadly threat. Black poisonous gas spilling into America's cities and it's massacring people by the thousands. This is Newark, New Jersey. This is Newark, New Jersey. Warning. Poisonous black smoke pouring in from Jersey marshes. Reaches South Street. Gas masks useless. Urge population to move into open spaces. Automobiles use Route 7, 23, 24. Avoid congested areas. Smoke now spreading over, over Raymond Boulevard. When the next reporter takes over the narrative of the events, the U.S. military has been obliterated. And all he can do is describe the terrible scene unfolding before his eyes. Our army is wiped out. Artillery, Air Force... Everything wiped out. This may be the last broadcast. We'll stay here to the end. People are holding service here below us in the cathedral. The enemy is now in sight above the palisades. Five, five great machines. First one is crossing the river. I can see it from here, waiting waiting the Hudson like a man waiting through a brook. A bulletin is handed me. Martian cylinders are falling all over the country. One outside of Buffalo, one in Chicago, St. Louis. Seem to be timed in space. Now the smoke's spreading faster. It's reached Times Square. People are trying to run away from it, but it's no use. They... They're falling like flies. Now the smoke's crossing 6th Avenue. 5th Avenue. Uh, a hundred yards away. It's... It's 50 feet. Calling CQ New York. Isn't there anyone on the air? Isn't there 
there anyone on the air? Isn't there anyone? By this time, about halfway through their radio drama, the producers are beginning to receive word of the panic, the real panic caused by this little stunt. One producer described as looking, quote, pale as death, said that the broadcast had to be shut down immediately before things got out of hand. But their reporter had just got done choking to death from poisonous gas live on the air. Things were already out of hand. As I set down these notes on paper, I'm obsessed by the thought that I may be the last living man on earth. Wells then picks up the narrative in a more traditional fashion that was more typical with this show, somewhat abandoning the live broadcast format. As the character, Dr. Pearson, he ruminates on how different the world is now. I've been hiding in this empty house near Grover's Mill, a small island of daylight cut off by the black smoke from the rest of the world. All that happened before the arrival of these monstrous creatures in the world now seems part of another life. A life that has no continuity with the present. Furtive existence of the lonely derelict who... Pencils these words on the back of some astronomical notes bearing the signature of Richard Pearson. My wife, my colleagues, my students, my books, my observatory, my... my world. Where are they? Did they ever exist? Am I Richard Pearson? What day is it? Do days exist without calendars? Does time pass when there are no human hands left to wind the clocks? Dr. Pearson then meets another survivor, a prepper, you might say, and a former soldier who has various plans for survival and what he thinks the world will look like soon, as well as the futility of what society used to look like. All that's happened so far is because we don't have sense enough to keep quiet. Bothering them with guns and such stuff and losing our heads and rushing off in crowds. Now, oh, instead of our rushing around blind, we got to fix ourselves up. Fix ourselves up according to the way things are now. Cities, nations, civilization, progress. Yes, but if that's so, what is there to live for? Well, there won't be any more concerts for a million years or so and no nice little dinners at restaurants. If it's amusement you're after, I guess the game's up. What is there left? Life, that's what. I want to live. All those little office workers that used to live in these houses, they'd be no good. They haven't any stuff in them. They used to run, run off to work. I've seen hundreds of them running to catch their commuter's train in the morning, afraid they'd get canned if they didn't. Running back at night, afraid they wouldn't be in time for dinner. Lives insured and a little invested in case of accidents. But this stranger's vision of the future turns very dark and hopeless and despotic at which Dr. Pearson abruptly leaves the man behind, and when the man asks him where he's going, Wells replies, Not, Not to your world. world. Bye, stranger. Dr. Pearson then walks the empty streets of New York City, where everything is quiet and eerie. There's no activity in the once busy intersections. The shops are closed with windows full of wares. Eventually, however, life on Earth returns to some sort of normality. And Dr. Pearson notes how strange it is to see young people out and about and enjoying the outdoors again and happy. And that just how strange it is to, that after so much abnormality that there could be a normality. If you're familiar with the book by H.G. Wells, then you know the ex machina that ultimately defeats the Martians. They're brought down by man's own greatest enemy, the enemy that now makes our own world, the real world, so very strange today. Later, when their bodies were examined in laboratories, it was found that they were killed by the putrefactive and disease bacteria against which their systems were unprepared. Slain, after all, man's defenses had failed by the humblest thing that God, as wisdom, has put upon this earth. Immediately following this broadcast, CBS had a full-blown crisis on their hands. They didn't know if they would be fined or arrested. They heard reports of traffic jams, riots, 
raids, heart attacks, flooded emergency rooms, even suicides. Wells himself was described as devastated by the apparent disaster he had caused, and he firmly believed that his career was done before it even got started. Policemen were now forcing their way into the CBS building, and a crowd of reporters had gathered outside. The staff had to be snuck out the back door, and the Times Square news banner read, quote, Orson Welles causes panic, end quote. Wells himself, though despondent, maintained an artist's confidence in his magnum opus. When asked if he should have toned down his drama, he replied, quote, No, you don't play murder in soft words. End quote. It was the ultimate fake news caper. By simply reworking an existing science fiction novel, he had succeeded in terrifying a nation already on edge, and his words had sent people into a crazed panic. People had died because of what he had done. Or had they? It seems Orson Welles, who appeared to be the puppet master of this grand prank, was actually the puppet of an even greater exhibition of fake news. In the three weeks following the infamous broadcast, the newspaper industry had published over 12,000 articles blasting not only Welles, but the irresponsible radio industry. Some print media executives even called for massive government censorship of the airwaves. The Chicago Tribune even slandered the intelligence of the people who listened to radio. Quote, It would be more tactful to say that some members of the radio audience are a trifle retarded mentally, and that many a program is prepared for their consumption. End quote. You see, as I alluded to at the beginning of this episode, the newspaper industry was getting its lunch eaten by radio. All the advertising money was being refunneled into this new media, and so, as it goes today, in order to stay relevant, they abandoned journalism and resorted to sensationalism. And they never would miss an opportunity for a hit job on anything radio. Besides some panicked phone calls to police stations and small gatherings of concerned citizens here and there, there was no pandemonium. There were no riots, no raids, no traffic jams, no emergency room flooding, no heart attacks, no suicides. Some people were scared for sure, but modern research has shown that Wells' audience was so small that almost nobody had any idea that the world was actually ending. Ironically, Wells himself later adopted the more sensational version of events as part of his own personal lore. And the negative press didn't exactly hurt his career either. Three short years later, he would go on to direct what's renowned as the greatest film ever made, Citizen Kane. The takeaway from studying these events for me is how careful we have to be with what we put in our heads. We never know exactly who we can trust and what motives lay unseen. Even the fact checkers may have an agenda. It's a depressing thought, no doubt. And so, who's the arbiter of truth? Perhaps, I think, it's our own intellect when it's calm and unclouded by confirmation bias. To keep our wits sharp, we must keep our humanity and our charity as our social institutions begin to creak and strain at the stress of pandemic. That thing in the news that's got us on edge, that makes us look at another person as if they're just too stupid to understand what's really happening, all of that sows the seeds of pandemonium. And by and large, it's all distraction and a sensational specter of a world that sensible and compassionate people should want no part of. What really matters are the people that we are so fortunate enough to be isolated with. When Orson Welles ended his infamous radio drama, he was obliged to remind his listeners that in reality, they had nothing to fear. This is Orson Welles, ladies and gentlemen. Out of character, to assure you that the War of the Worlds has no further significance than as the holiday offering it was intended to be. The Mercury Theater's own radio version of dressing up in a sheet and jumping out of a bush and saying boo. Starting now, we couldn't soap all your windows and steal all your garden gates by tomorrow night, so we did the best next thing. We annihilated the world before your very ears and utterly destroyed the CBS. You will be relieved, I hope, to learn that we didn't mean it and that both institutions are still open for business. So goodbye, everybody, and remember, please, for the next day or so, the terrible lesson you learned tonight. 
that grinning, glowing, globular invader of your living room is an inhabitant of the pumpkin patch, and if your doorbell rings and nobody's there, that was no Martian, it's Halloween. <laughs> When I was researching this episode, I was floored to discover that Orson Welles was only 23 at the time of his infamous broadcast. When I asked my wife if she could believe that at 23 he could cause so much chaos, she wittily replied that it sounds like something a 23-year-old would do. If you enjoyed this episode and felt like it was worth a dollar, I would sure appreciate that dollar. As much as I enjoy this little side project of mine, it isn't free to produce, so to help offset the cost, I have a Patreon page set up where you can go and pledge a dollar a month. And believe me when I say that every dollar helps. You can find the link to my Patreon page on my website, writteninbloodhistory.com, or you can simply go to patreon.com slash writteninbloodhistory. That'll take you directly there. As you stay home while we ride out this quarantine, if you find you're looking for some other history podcasts to consume, I have a few that I can recommend uh, that come from very good people. Um, and you can generally find them anywhere that you listen to podcasts. Thugs and Miracles is a podcast on the history of the French monarchy. It's an excellent one. Badger State, a Wisconsin history podcast. History of Ottawa, New Zealand podcast. The Happy Hour History podcast. The History Cash podcast. Body Count, a history podcast. And Footnoting History. And if you didn't catch all those, I'll put the links up on their episodes on the show notes for this episode. One final ask is that you take a moment to give me a rating or review wherever you listen. I can't tell you how much a nice review brightens a podcaster's day. As always, thank you so very much for listening to Written in Blood History. Stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll see you later. <laughs>